So today officially begins our journey toward Easter and the celebration of Resurrection Sunday. So along the way, we're going to encounter several significant truths about who God is and what he is capable of. And that's all going to take place in the context of this series called Graves into Gardens. So for the next five weeks, we're going to look at how God can take people and circumstances that are broken and in the most profound ways, not only restore them, but raise them up to a completely new life. So to get us started, I want to go all the way back to a time before Jesus. Long before the cross, long before the beginning of the church, to a time when God was really in the very early stages of creating a nation and a people set apart for himself. So if we go back far enough in Genesis, we find the account of a man named Abraham. God made Abraham a promise in the book of Genesis chapter 12. And in verses 2 and 3, we can see a part of that. He said, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And so Abraham eventually had a son named Isaac, who eventually had a son named Jacob. God changed Jacob's name to Israel, and he eventually had 12 sons. And through a crazy series of events and prophetic dreams, God eventually saved Israel, his 12 sons, and their wives and their children from famine by bringing them to Egypt. And that's where the people and nation of Israel began to grow and increase in number. And they grew and increased so much that it begins to worry the king of Egypt. And he forces all of the people into slavery. As the years progress, the people of Israel, or the Hebrews, they face oppression that just gets worse and worse. But God, who keeps his promises and is always good, actually uses that oppression to raise up his appointed leader to deliver his people out of Egypt. And we know that that leader's name was Moses. God sends Moses to the king of Egypt to demand the release of his people. And when the king refuses, God begins to send plagues. These plagues afflict the people of Egypt, but they don't touch the Hebrews. Through nine plagues, the king remains stubborn, and he remains hard-hearted, and he refuses to free God's people. Finally, God unleashes the last plague. We can read about that in Exodus chapter 11. We're going to jump in at verse 4. So Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, nor ever will be again. The death of the firstborn was the plague that would break the king's resolve convince him to free the Hebrews. God also gave his people instruction on how to be spared from this plague. 
God tells each household to take a lamb, and on a very specific day, in a very specific way, that lamb would become a sacrifice and a meal. But more importantly, though, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 7, this is what God instructs them. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. So they're going to take the blood of this lamb and they're going to smear it around their door. So this seems kind of weird. Seems kind of strange. But God goes on to explain why this is important, picking up at verse 12 in chapter 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is also where we find the beginning of the Feast of Passover. And that, of course, is still celebrated by Jews and many Christians all around the world every year. But after this plague had passed, the king released the Hebrew people and they set off to a land promised to them by God. Seems like the promise made to Abraham so very long ago is on the cusp of being fulfilled. After enduring so many trials, so much pain and heartache, the oppression of slavery, the people are finally free and leaving Egypt. Exodus chapter 14, starting at verse 5 says, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, what is this we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel, while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped at the sea by Pi-Haharoth in front of baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. So now I want you to put yourself in the shoes of the Hebrews for just a few moments. You have this ages old promise that you have been believing for longer than you can remember. You have watched God spare you from chaos and calamity that is happening all around you. Even as you watch other people suffer and fall to it. Even so, your situation is not exactly ideal. Sometimes it might even feel crushing to you when you thought things would never change or improve for you, you finally see forward momentum, progress toward the promise, and you begin to have hope. 
that feels like you're walking into a new season of freedom. And then you find yourself facing things that appear to be more difficult and more destructive than the things that you just left behind. Does this sound familiar to anybody but me? I mean, really. But here's the thing, what's even worse is that sometimes we all play the part of the people standing on the shore of the sea. Don't you remember how good we had it in Egypt? Don't you remember how great things were yesterday? Don't you remember how awesome it was last year? Wasn't life great before 2020? Things were so much better where I used to live, where I used to work, where I used to be. When we adopt that kind of attitude, it completely discredits and disregards everything that God has done since then to get us to where we are today. Things were so much better then. Never mind the fact that God has grown me in ways that I couldn't even have imagined then. Never mind that I have learned to trust God more. Never mind that I've experienced what real provision from God looks like. Never mind that he never promised me a journey without difficulty. I just want the comfortable things that I used to have, that I used to know. Oh, and also never mind that when I had those things, I also complained about them too. But, Oftentimes, we can also easily find ourselves in the position Moses was standing in, there on the shore. We get accused, we get blamed, we get berated for things that were no fault of our own. And you'll especially find this to be true when you get real serious about following God's direction for your life. Don't believe me? Do the thing God told you to do that doesn't make sense. Do the thing God said to do that doesn't conform to popular cultural opinion. Live your life according to the principles and the precepts that God established in his word. And you will quickly discover just how many people are willing to let you know that everything is your fault. So now here they are standing on the shore of the sea. The army of Egypt is charging at them over the mountains. Moses is just trying to be faithful to follow the call and leading of God. The people are blaming Moses for their problems. Nothing is getting any better. And meanwhile, God is standing here going, hey, remember me? But the people are so focused on the problem of the sea and the encroaching enemy that they can't hear or see God in the midst of it. The followers of Jesus found themselves in a similar situation in the days following his crucifixion. The one that they had followed so faithfully the one that they had placed their trust in, the one that they believed would set right so many things that were wrong, was now dead. And for three days he stayed dead. To make matters worse, word spread quickly when the tomb where they had placed his body was found empty. Rumors, lies, speculation, fear, Maybe some hope, expectation, a million other thoughts and emotions flooded their hearts and their minds. And because of the situations and circumstances around them, they really became blind to the truth of what was happening. We find a story about that blindness in Luke chapter 24. And I could summarize it, but... I just can't tell it better than Luke tells it. 
So in Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 13, we find this account. Now that same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. Then he asked them, what is this dispute that you're having with each other as you're walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. The one named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there these days? Well, what things? he asked. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. They came near the village where they were going, and he gave the impression that he was going farther. But they urged him, stay with us because it's almost evening and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But he disappeared from their sight. How many times are we face to face with Jesus, but we're too blinded by our circumstances to recognize him? What's even more tragically hilarious is when we are so confident in ourselves in the midst of our circumstances that much like these two people on the road to Emmaus, we begin to tell Jesus who he is. Oh God, this is not how things are supposed to be. Jesus, I know this isn't what you want for my life. Lord, you know that this is not what I need right now. But what if it is exactly what you need? What if that thing that you hate so much and that makes you so uncomfortable is exactly the thing that God intends to use to get you where you need to go? to get you to trust that he is more than able to do it? What if it's exactly what you need? Now you might think, circling back to our Hebrews on the seashore, how could anyone witness the plagues of Egypt or the events surrounding Jesus' death and not acknowledge or recognize the presence and the power of God? How can anyone see those things and not realize that God's right there in the midst of it all? These are not the only times this has happened or will happen. We can go back and we can look at the beginning of the life and ministry of a prophet named Samuel. We find Samuel conveniently located in the book of 1 Samuel. 
We're going to jump into chapter 3, right at verse 1. And Here's where we find him. The boy Samuel served the Lord in Eli's presence. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare and prophetic visions were not widespread. One day, Eli, whose eyesight was failing, was lying in his usual place. Before the lamp of God had gone out, Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was located. Then the Lord called Samuel and he answered, Here I am. He ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. I didn't call, Eli replied. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Once again, the Lord called Samuel. Samuel got up, went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. I didn't call my son, he replied. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord because The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Once again, for the third time, the Lord called Samuel. He got up, went to Eli, and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli understood that the Lord was calling the boy. He told Samuel, Go and lie down. If he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came, stood there, and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel responded, speak, for your servant is listening. So Samuel is literally living, sleeping in the house of God, in the temple. And he doesn't recognize the voice of God when he hears it. Now, this should be a lesson to us all that a comfort and a familiarity with church does not mean that we know or have a relationship with God. So again, just being comfortable, just being happy, just being familiar with your circumstances does not mean that you're in a right relationship with God. And being uncomfortable, being unhappy, or being unfamiliar doesn't mean that you're not in the center of God's will for your life. So one more example for you. This time, from the back of the book, from the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, beginning in chapter 4 and moving forward, God gives us a glimpse into the future. He shows us some of what will be taking place in heaven and also future devastation, destruction, and calamity that will happen on earth. And there will be people who will be alive to endure and live through some of these terrible things that are going to take place. So just some of what God says will happen in these days include famine, plague, great earthquakes, a rain of hail, fire, and blood, meteorites falling from space and poisoning water supplies, and even an unleashing of an army of demons. Good times. Revelation chapter 9 verse 6 says, In those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Eventually, though, people will die from some of these things. And you would think that after seeing these kinds of destruction and death, any survivors would be calling out to God to save them, to rescue them, to have mercy on them. But in Revelation 9 verses 20 and 21, here's what we find. The rest of the people who were not killed by these plagues 
did not repent of the works of their hands to stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, which cannot see, hear, or walk. And they did not repent of their murders, their sorceries, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. They witness all this destruction and yet still refuse to turn to the one who could save them. They will be so blind to the power of God that they will not turn to him even when he is the only one where they can find hope and salvation. So now we have to go back to that seashore. Back to Moses and the Israelites trapped between an approaching army and a sea that they cannot cross. The people are crying out. It would have been better if we would have just stayed and died in Egypt. Where is God in all of this now? In Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, Moses speaks up. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Because in the midst of panic, in the midst of circumstances we can only begin to imagine, fear of the approaching army and nowhere to run, God basically says, quit freaking out! Your circumstances may not look great. You might think things are hopeless and that you are completely helpless. You might look at the hills and see an army of enemies with your natural eyes. But I want to encourage you today that if that's where you feel like you are, take a second look. And how about we look through the lens of Psalm 121, verses 1 through 8. I lift up my eyes to the hills from where... From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. I can turn my eyes to the hills and see an enemy in the natural, but if I open up my eyes, when I turn my eyes to the hills, I see where my help comes from. It comes from the Lord. Now, do we act foolishly, stupidly, recklessly? No, because among other things, God has given us a spirit of sound judgment or a sound mind. But he also reminds us in Romans 8, 28, that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So what do we see? When we're faced with insurmountable opposition, trouble and distress that we cannot overcome, what does God do? When the Hebrews on the shore of the sea were faced with those things, what does God do? Exodus 14, 21 and 22. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground. 
the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. God turned the sea of destruction into a highway of deliverance. I'm talking eight lanes, all one direction, full speed ahead, where just moments before, there was no way to move forward. He is the God who turns seas into highways. The question becomes then, what is the sea that you are facing? What's standing in your way? What's the thing that God has brought you to that feels like the end and feels like destruction? Y'all know how I feel about feelings. Mm. Make no mistake about it. What it is, whatever it is, God can split that thing right down the middle and walk you right through it. He didn't lead you into a graveyard. No, he has marched you straight into the beginning of your greatest testimony. And now I want you to watch this. In Exodus 14, picking up at verse 23, the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning, and in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel. The Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. When you give God the opportunity to turn your seas into highways, the enemy is going to come after you. There will be a pursuit. He does not want to see you succeed. He does not want to see you prosper. He does not want to see you grow. And somewhere on the highway, you might even hear him coming. You might see the evidence of his advancement. But when the road you're on is one that only God could make, eventually that devil is going to look around and say, Oh no, how did I get here? How did I wind up in the middle of this mess? I got to get out of here. And he's going to turn tail and start running back to where he came from. Exodus 14, 27. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Of all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Not only will God deliver you from your enemy, he will bury him behind you. Don't lose sight of God in your mess because chances are it's really just the middle of your miracle. And I hope I hope that that fills you with hope and excitement for the future. But I have to take you back one more time. I have to take you back to remind you what secured that promise and that miracle for the Israelites in the first place. See, the only reason that any of them were spared to walk out of Egypt 
The only reason they were able to follow the pillar of fire and cloud as God led them through the desert. The only reason they made it to the sea in the first place. The only reason they were able to witness the sea becoming a highway. The only reason they were afforded the opportunity to see God victorious over their enemy is because they were found under the blood of the Lamb. It set them apart. It marked them as belonging to God. And that's where we find how for so very long God had been pointing ahead to what he would accomplish on the cross. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, the end of that verse we find this statement, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. And so the question today is, are you under the blood of the lamb? That is the first sea that you cannot cross. It is the first mountain that you cannot climb. Bridging the gap between you and God that was created by sin. I want to invite the worship team to make their way back up today. Accepting and putting yourself under the blood of the Lamb sets you apart. It puts you in right relationship with God. And that is what sets you up for victory. That is what sets you up for deliverance. That's what sets you up for hope and sets you up for life and sets you up for restoration and resurrection in every other area of your life. Are you under the blood of the Lamb? When you are under and endowed with a power like no other. That's when you're under the blood of the Lamb. When you're under the blood of the Lamb, you are claimed and called by God. You are set apart and sanctified. And you are secure in a love that never fails, that never gives up, that never runs out. No matter what obstacle you face, no matter what challenges might rise, no matter how the enemy pursues you, his love will never fail and his blood will never fail. And so the question remains, are you under the blood of the Lamb? And then if you are, what's the sea that you're facing? What's coming over the mountains at you? And have you lost track of the one who can deliver you from it all? Have you wavered in your trust? Have you lost sight of the truth that he is the God that turns seas into highways. We can look around and take an inventory of all the things wrong in our world. And it's easy to say, God, I know this isn't how you want things to be. We live in a fallen world, folks. But God's bigger. And so, if God can turn seas into highways, what can he turn your circumstance and situation into? More than that, what can he turn you into? What can he do with your life? If you live in that promise, 
being under the blood of the lamb. There's no limit to what he can do. There's no limit to his love and his power revealed in you, through you, and for you. And we're gonna continue this journey for the next four weeks and see how God transforms all the broken things into something far better and more beautiful than we could ever imagine or accomplish on our own. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning? Father, we thank you. We thank you that we, when we find ourselves on a shore of uncertainty, on the shore of a sea of destruction, chaos, and calamity, God, you remain. You remain good. You remain strong. You remain faithful. That there's nothing that catches you by surprise. There's nothing that you can't overcome. Nothing that you can't transform. Nothing that you can't work for our good. So God, we just ask, give us eyes to see. In the middle of everything that comes our way, the things that are unexpected, the things that derail our lives, help us to just be still and watch you work. Father, we thank you that that's not just who you were, but it's who you are right now. Stir that truth in our hearts. God, that it would be a fire shut up in our bones that we cannot contain. That we would have to shout the truth of your great power and love at work within us. Lord, we love you. We thank you today for being the God who turns our seas into highways. We praise you and we thank you. We glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I hope that you've been blessed by this word, encouraged or challenged in some kind of way. If you are joining us for the first time, remember that the experience does not end here. I want to invite you to visit lifesongfamily.org slash connect and fill out that digital connect card so we can get to know you better and find out how we can serve you and your family better here at Lifesong Family Church. Of course, be sure to like and follow us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter as well so you can keep up with everything that is happening here at Lifesong Family Church. And as always, as you are able, we invite you to join us in person right here in Lewisburg, Tennessee. We can't wait to see you.